Can you guys hear me? Yes. Sound all right? Okay. Well, if you guys are ready to begin, we'll we'll go ahead and start with a prayer. If you'd like to join me, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be here to uh, meet fellow Christians, fellow Christians of like mind, and we're just able to come together to worship you, Lord. It is such a blessing to us, Lord. You are so good to us, and there's no way that we can return it. We thank you for the love that you've shown to us. We thank you for your son that died for us, and we thank you for your Holy Spirit who revealed all things to us, Lord. Lord, we just love you so much. Uh, please forgive us of where we sin and, and where we fall short, Lord, and please be with us in this hour. Through Christ I pray. Amen. Well, uh, my name is Tanner Smith. Uh, I'm a first-year student at the Brown Trail School of Preaching, um, and I am the one who is bringing um, this morning's Bible study. So I understand, I think Northfleet has been here a few times. Uh, what does he usually do for, for Bible studies in the morning? Does he have a... Really? <laughs> does he have a book he was working through, or how does he do it? Oh, you just have, you do subjects and yeah. stuff? Okay. Generally, we have a class of our Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting being, you know, at, what time do we finish out to? 10.15. 10.15, okay. Uh, it's interesting kind of being a traveling preacher, you could say, just because oftentimes we're not at the same congregation two times in a row. So it's, it's tough when you come in and you have to teach a Bible study because when we go through and we work through, uh, let's say, an epistle, you need to understand all different aspects of it. You know, like you need to work through... Um, the background of the church, the establishment of it, usually in the book of Acts, um, and then understand, you know, what the composition of the church is. Is it mostly Jew, mostly Gentile? When was Paul there? What did he see? Uh, when was he writing it? What's his purpose of doing so? So when you're just having a one-shot Bible study with a congregation, it is pretty tough. So uh, my answer and, and my solution to this is I want to give you guys something that you can walk away with. And I think if we just start breaking halfway into an epistle, um, we might go over information, but I, I don't think it's going to be of any benefit to you guys. So what I ended up doing is I went ahead and, and I wrote a study on the beginning of Ephesians. And this is something that we can cover in one class. Uh, we'll go into the book of Acts. If you could turn with me, we'll begin in Acts chapter 18, verse 19. Um, Acts chapter 18, verse 19. But I, I, I like going through and, and just working through this because as a congregation, you're able to see the development of the church here in Ephesus. Um, and you're able to, to really walk away with a pretty decent understanding of the beginning of this church and kind of the background of the book of Ephesians. Usually I'll, I'll work through this in Acts and then it's kind of hard to say, but usually there's five to ten minutes-ish left over and from there I'll go into the book of Ephesians and just pick up where I left off with the last congregation and so far I think I've worked through the study six times or seven times and I'm in Ephesians 2 so <laughs> it's pretty slow going um, but we'll, we'll begin here in, in Acts chapter 18 um, usually if you ask someone to point you to um, the beginning of the church in Ephesus, in the book of Acts, they're going to bring you to Acts chapter 19. Um, and that's going to be Paul in his third missionary journey. But Paul is going to spend some time in Act, or in Ephesus on the tail end of his second missionary journey. And that's what we're going to begin with here in Acts chapter 18. Uh, he's going to go there, and then the Jews there are going to want him to stay a little bit longer, but he's going to have to leave. Um, so he leaves Priscilla and Aquila there, and then he comes back in Acts chapter 19. So this is the initial coming there. Uh, just a little background here of the city of Ephesus. Um, Ephesus was a wealthy, largely populated port city um, in Asia, modern-day Turkey. It's on the northern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, it was a part of the one, one of the four major trade routes of the Roman Empire, and this was the Appian Way. So if you think about it, 
Ephesus is a major port city. It has one of the major trade routes of the Roman Empire going through it. What a better place for a church, right? You have this many people coming through. They're, they're going to this many different places. What a great opportunity for them to hear the gospel and spread it throughout the rest of the world. So uh, it was, as I said, it, it was frequented by travelers. Um, and this was extremely important in early Christianity. Um, also, Ephesus was home to the Temple of Artemis, or the Temple of Diana, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, known for its size and beauty. And when we're looking at this, much of the culture was centered around pagan worship. And this plays in later. We'll see in Acts chapter 19, um, the riot at Ephesus, where eventually they end up driving Paul out of there. And really, it was all based upon the economy. Um, Paul made such an impact in Christianity, or you should say God made such an impact here in Ephesus, that actually the economy was starting to change. Uh, much of the culture was based around pagan worship, so they would go and they'd pay silversmiths to make them idols to worship, right? Common practice. Well, now Christianity comes into play, and they go, okay, you can't go and worship these idols, right? You can't go and pay and have these made to worship them. No, we're worshiping God now. So what about these silversmiths who rely on this for the economy, for a living, right? So they get pretty worked up about it. They get pretty mad. And then you have the riot at Ephesus, which you see in Acts chapter 19, um, really in, in verse 26 and quite a few verses in there. Um, but a lot of the culture is, is based around pagan worship. This later gives context with a couple points in Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, if Lord willing, if we work through this study here in Acts, if I actually start into it, um, we'll get into Ephesians chapter 2. And, and there Paul talks a lot about who they were before Christ and who they are after Christ. So their pagan background plays a heavy role within Ephesians chapter 2. So <clears throat> to begin, uh, let's go to Acts chapter 18. Uh, beginning in verse, let's go to verse 18. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centuria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed uh, from Ephesus. So we see his initial entry here into Ephesus. He spends some time there in the synagogue reasoning with the Jews, and it appears that they're showing interest to it, right? What did they say to him? They said, could you stay with us a little while longer? But ultimately, he, he had to depart from there. Uh, but he does promise to return. He says, God willing. And ultimately, obviously, he does end up returning. But notice this. Why couldn't he stay with them there in Ephesus? See in verse 21, he has to keep the coming feast in Jerusalem. Well, I should raise a question. Usually, the Jews had to keep three feasts in Jerusalem. It was Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Booths. Paul's a Christian. Why does he say he has to keep a feast? So, Richard, what version are you using? Because mine does not talk about a feast. Oh, really? New King James. Okay. What are you using? Okay, gotcha. That's interesting. I have NIV, and it doesn't have it in there. Either. Mine says it's uh, a holiday. Okay, gotcha. Which holiday would tie back with Passover, Pentecost, and Booths? Be the same idea. Um, that's interesting. I'll have to look at this that. Verse twenty-one. Yeah, verse twenty-one. Mine says, as Paul was leaving them, he said, "I will come to you again if God wants me to." And so Paul sailed away from Ephesus. Hmm. Can you read yours? Yeah, uh, verse twenty-one. But take, took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Well, that's what mine says, except it calls it a holiday instead of a... So mine basically says what you say. Oh, it's just it's weird how it's left out of these other verses. Yeah, that's interesting. I'd have to go through and look. At, I haven't had that yet. My that's, footnote says a festival. Yeah, same thing with the Passover. Well, Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I'll have to go through and I'll have to read that further. I've done this, I think, six times. I've never had that come yeah. up. That's interesting. We'll I'll have to look at that. Um, just for the sake of this, though, if he does have to go and, and keep a feast or keep a holiday, why do you think it would be so important to him? I would think maybe because um, when, when there is a, a major holiday or festival like that, there's a whole lot more people in the synagogue, a whole mm -hmm. lot more people in Jerusalem, and there's just more people to preach to. Exactly. I think you're right on. And, and you, you could tie it back to Acts chapter 2. I mean, there we're dealing with uh, Pentecost. You know, all the Jews are, are assembling in one area. And you think about it, who would be most receptive to hearing the gospel? It would be the Jews who are awaiting the Messiah, right? So if you have a large gathering of Jews here, what a perfect opportunity for Paul to bring the gospel. They're going to go there. They're going to hear the gospel. Lord willing, they'll obey it. And then they go back to their regions and continually spread the gospel. So I think what we're, we're dealing with here is an evangelism uh, mindset coming from Paul. Uh, so verse 21, uh, Paul sails away from Ephesus. But remember, beginning there in, in verse 18, he had Priscilla and Aquila with him. He's going to leave Priscilla and Aquila here in Ephesus as he sails away. Uh, and, and picking up in verse 24 here, we'll go 24 through 28. We're going to be introduced to a little bit of the work that Priscilla and Aquila are going to be doing here um, while Paul is gone. And we're also going to be introduced to uh, one of the major players of the New Testament, and that's going to be Apollos. But at this point, he's not going to be a Christian yet. So we're going to see the conversion of Apollos here. Verses 24 through 28. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. Notice this. Though he only knew the baptism of John. Uh, verse 26. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. When, when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews, publicly showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So, we're introduced here to Apollos. Uh, Apollos was a very intelligent man. He was from the second most important city in the Roman Empire. That's Alexandria down in Egypt. Uh, Alexandria was home to Jewish universities, a thriving Jewish population, and, of course, the library of Alexandria. Uh, if, you're, if you understand what the Septuagint is, the Septuagint was written here at Alexandria. So very well-educated area. And Apollos was the same. He was a very well-educated Jew. Uh, and, and ultimately, as I said, and as I'm sure you know, Apollos, he, he is converted and he goes on to do great things for Christ. His intelligence actually plays a huge role in, in New Testament Christianity that we read. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 13. Pick up in, I'll pick up in verse 12 here. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you except Christus and Gaius, lest anyone should say I baptized in my own name. So we see a little bit of the division there. Um, beginning, and if we go into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6, we see the argument further just a little bit more. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, notice this, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. We can go back to Acts chapter 18 here. Um, so 
after after Apollos's conversion, he goes on and ultimately he does great things for God. He does great things for Jesus, and he he uses his education and he uses his knowledge in a way that he brings others to Christ. In fact, in Corinth, um, he was doing such a great job that there were divisions within the congregation. Essentially, it's at its core like kind of the beginning of denominationalism. They were claiming to be of a teacher rather than being of Christ, right? So they're saying, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas. Um, so Apollos goes on, and, and he does great things, and he teaches very well. And the division is in no way Apollos' fault, or in no way Peter's fault, or in no way Paul's fault as well. Um, it is them just clinging on to whatever teacher they like, right? Um, but he, so obviously he goes on to do great things, but at this point he's just a Jew that knows the baptism of John. You see that in verse 25. Uh, being fervent in the Spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew the baptism of John. Now this is interesting. Not a lot of people point this out, but I really like bringing this out. You're going to see the baptism of John here in uh, verse 25 of Acts chapter 18, dealing with Apollos and Later in Acts chapter 19 in verses 1 through 6 with the starting 12 here at Ephesus, um, you're going to see 12 more people who only know the baptism of John. This is interesting. So we know who John the Baptist is, right? He was the forerunner before Christ. He was prophesied of in Isaiah and Malachi as well. He was the forerunner. Um, he prepared the way for the Lord. And he taught the baptism of remission of sins and repentance. Uh, but then obviously while Christ was still alive in his ministry, um, Herod goes ahead and he takes out John the Baptist. He imprisons him and ultimately kills him, right? So now we're dealing with decades and decades and decades later, hundreds of miles from Judea. And these people know the baptism of John. I think that's amazing. I think it, it shows just how widespread John the Baptist's teachings were. That even decades after he died, we still see people here in a completely different region who only know the baptism of John or, or who know the baptism of John. I think oftentimes the, the role of John the Baptist isn't necessarily overplayed, but the uh, uh, impact that he had is sometimes underplayed. It's, it's underwhelmed. I mean, we're dealing with much time and, and much, much distance between, and John the Baptist's teaching is, is known here. I think that's an interesting point to bring out. So uh, he only knows the baptism of John. Verse 26, uh, Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They take him aside and they explain to him the way of God more accurately. And I want to make a point here. Uh, here Aquila and Priscilla take him aside, rebuke him, teach him the way of God more accurately. Um, it is implied here they, they teach him the gospel. They bring him to Christ um, and he accepts it. But some make large jumps in saying that this justifies women teaching over believing men in the church today. And they say that this overrules what would be 1 Corinthians chapter 14 or 1 Timothy chapter 2. Um, but we also understand when we, when we study the Bible, it's, there aren't contradictions within it. If there are contradictions, it's, it's in how we're taking it and it's within our understanding. So... Uh, but people, people will use this verse in order to overrule the clear verses in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, in fact, I, I have an article here, and I have the title of it, or a portion of it, I should say. Uh, here the author writes, um, her referring to Priscilla, her partnership with Aquila exemplifies the equality and collaboration between men and women in the context of service, providing a foundation for women's involvement in leadership and teaching roles in the church. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that this is a very large jump for them to say, but people are going to try to use this as an example to talk about um, women preachers or, or women elders or different things like that. And without turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 or 1 Timothy chapter 2, I think we need to take their text and show them the truth out of it. So what would you say... Why is this not an example of women preaching over men in the church? Well, it says they took him aside. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
with, you know, I picture in my mind them sitting around a table eating and talking together. Right, it's not a public. Yeah, this something, you know, not in, in the synagogue, you know, leading them. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a good point. I think that's part of it, definitely, 100%. I think there's other parts of it, too. And they're just they were they would go as far as assuming that it could have been more than it was, um, but also at this point, is Apollos a Christian? No. So he's not a Christian yet. Um, are they in the New Testament worship assembly? Right, exactly. He only knew the baptism of John, right? Mm -hmm. So, now this is just one of those examples where I mean, people in denominationalism, um, other people, they, they come to the Bible with preconceived ideas, and, and we can even do this at times too. They come to the Bible with, with preconceived ideas, and they let it overrule what the scriptures actually reveal and what the scriptures actually say. Um, and, and they try to find any and, and every which way they can to back their beliefs. And this is just one of the examples that people will go to in order to do so. Um, and I, I went through and I, I wrote this Bible study, oh, I think a couple months ago at this point. And it, it was literally, I think two weeks ago, maybe, um, I was on social media and um, it came up with someone talking about this exact verse talking about women preaching and everything like that. And this is one of the things that they use to back it up. So you definitely see it out there within the world. That's so. a very good stretch for me, but <laughs> there's no preaching going on. Yeah. I mean, there, you know, if I were to have come across somebody and, you know, I know who it is, and I'm not going to not talk to that person about Christ. If, yeah, but absolutely, if, yeah. If, Exactly. We're, about, we're not. We're not leading the church. We're not leading. Uh, you know, he gives us our roles, and our roles are important. And mm -hmm. there's nothing that we should feel like we've been slighted because you know, Christ is. It's all about God. It's all about what He wants. And yeah. It's not that He thinks He always gives people. It's not like He thinks that we can't do the job. It's just that's not where He wants us. Exactly. We have a lot. We have a lot. I think so. Right? Ultimately, it's God. It's up to God. I mean, we're here to work in and do what He wants. So it's not about us. It's yeah. completely up to Him. I 100% agree. And I mean, you look at, I mean, in First Timothy chapter three or, or Titus one one, <coughs> you see qualifications and elders in First Timothy chapter three, the beginning of it, and Titus one one. Um, and believe it or not, I'm not qualified to be an elder. <laughs> so it's like, it's it's very tough to to meet the qualifications to be an elder. They're plenty of people who don't need it and it's I think there's a reason that God made it um, made it so tough to, to become one the things that you need to be able to uh, uh, fulfill and uh, the qualifications you need to meet um, it's, it's definitely not just anyone right and the same thing with with deacons in first Timothy chapter 3 um, yeah anything else on the subject Let's see here. I think now we can, we'll see how much we get through. Uh, now we can get into, let's go to Acts chapter 19. So, uh, Paul left Priscilla and Aquila there in Ephesus. Now we're introduced to Apollos. Um, and remember back in Acts chapter 18, he, he promised the Jews there in the synagogue that he was going to return. Well, now in, in Acts chapter 19, we're introduced to Paul's third missionary journey. And guess where he goes back to? He goes back to Ephesus. Um, so he keeps his promise. He comes back to Ephesus. And in this, 
Lord willing, if we get through it, we're going to see three building blocks of the church at Ephesus, and we can kind of touch on how they play into the actual book of Ephesians here. Uh, these three building blocks, initially it's going to be the starting 12, and that's going to be verses 1 through 6. Um, and these are going to be similar to Apollos, as I said. They're Jews who only know the baptism of John. Um, so this is the first building block. That's going to be the starting 12. And then from there, he's going to go to the synagogue. Remember, he told them that he would return, and he's going to stay there, and he's going to reason with them for three months. Um, and this is going to be the second building block at the church at Ephesus. He's going to pull some away, uh, but then like other times within the book of Acts, the other Jews push him out. They drive him out of there. They get sick of him. Um, and then the third building block is the school of Tyrannus, which we'll talk about. And I think this is where we see the introduction of a lot of Greeks into the church here at Ephesus. Um, so two building blocks that we're going to deal with, mostly Jews. Third building block, Greeks. And you see it come out within the book of Ephesians. Uh, so we'll begin Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. Notice this too. I didn't bring this out, but uh, while Apollos was at Corinth, where did we read about, uh, some are saying, I am a Paul, and, and some of them are saying that I'm of Apollos. It's in 1 Corinthians, right? So here, Apollos is actually at Corinth, and we see the background of that interaction and everything. Um, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus after finding some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. We see that you know, hearkened on once again here with these 12. Uh, verse 4, then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Uh, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid hands on them, the gift of the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Verse 7, uh, now the men were about 12 in all. Um, so Paul comes into the area, and notice that there at the end of verse 1, he finds some disciples. What disciples are we dealing with here? Whose disciples are they? Poor wife. <laughs> Preacher's wife is the best. <laughs> she hears the same stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're, we're dealing with John's disciples here. They only know the baptism of John. So we're dealing with uh, some Jews who were John's disciples. And Paul, he, he questions them. He asks them, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Um, and, and going on from there, I'll bring this point forward. Uh, verse 5. They, in verse 4, they're, they're corrected, and it's implied that they learn about who Jesus Christ is. Verse 5, what's notable about their reaction? They just want to hear you know, what they heard. They were quick to act, and they were baptized in Jesus. Yeah, it's an immediate thing, right? It's not, you know, let me go and, and sit on it for three weeks and, and really think it through. Uh, it's not... You know, let me, you can bring it into Luke chapter 9. It isn't, you know, let me go and, and bury my father first. It isn't, let me go and, and do this and that. No, they immediately obey the gospel and go into Christ. And it, it shows, you know, the work of John. He was preparing the way for Christ. And these are people that we're dealing with here. They're John's disciples. They have been prepared and they were ready to hear the message of Christ. So now in, in verse 4, when they hear the message, in verse 5, they react. They immediately drop everything and, and become disciples of Christ. Um, and then going on from there, that concludes the, the first um, the first building block here uh, at the Church of Ephesus. It's going to be the Jews at the starting 12. Uh, beginning in verse 8, remember the, the people in the synagogue in Acts chapter 18, they wanted him to stay with them a little bit longer. So Acts 8, he returns back to the synagogue. We'll go 8 through 10 to see the second building block here. Uh, and he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil in the way of the Lord before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples. Uh, 
So notice this here right off the bat in verse 9. When some were hardened and did not believe, what is the inverse of this? What's the flip side of this? Tell us. Some did, right? If some did it, then some did. So we do have some Jews getting converted here out of uh, out of the synagogue. Um, so going on from there, he withdraws from the synagogue, and we'll pick up in verse nine. Uh, he departed from them, withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus, and this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. Both Jews and Greeks. So, you probably have a question as you read verse 9, as I did when I first read it. What's the school of Tyrannus? So yeah, he's going to go through and he's going to create that, that separate meeting hall. He's going to create that separate group. <laughs> so you're studying the safe school of Tyrannus? I'm sorry? Does your safe school of Tyrannus? Uh -huh. Mine says lecture hall of Tyrannus. Like okay. lecture and uh, a meeting room. Which that furthers what I believe it is. There's two schools of thought when it comes to this. And one of them I think is more likely than the other. The one school of thought that I think is less likely is that it's another synagogue. Um, which, I mean... With these things, it's tough because there's no way of, of fully knowing, and so there's no reason to, to really argue one way or the other, in my opinion. Um, one is that it's a synagogue, and the other is that it's a Greek lecture hall. Uh, Greek, he also calls it a gymnasium. Um, they're common. It's, it's essentially like a one-room schoolhouse where philosophers and everyone would lecture and teach. Um, so I think that furthers what I think it is, is the lecture hall. That's what my notes. <clears throat> That's what my notes say. Yeah. yeah. So they were playing basketball in the room. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we should have preached that next time. <laughs> they had these schools that tended to meet in the mornings. They met in the mornings to uh, have classes and lectures and discussion. Mm -hmm. If I hadn't got too hot yet, and they said that they generally yeah. left in the afternoon. <laughs> and I think Paul was. Speculate Paul was tent making in the morning when it was cooler. And that makes sense. Because he was going into this empty school and using it as a gathering place in the afternoon. I could totally see that. Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. And those ruins are there. Like if you go to Ephesus, they have the school, the ruins of the school of Tyrannus are, are there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are they pretty certain on it and everything? Yeah. That's, this guy shows a picture of it. says the school of Tyrannus, Ephesus. It says it's just ruins. This side is fairly certain that that's it. That's interesting. That's awesome. No, I'll have to check that out. I'll have to check that out. Um, yeah, so I think that's what we're dealing with here. Good <coughs> thoughts going forward. Um, and obviously, he's going to go there. He's going to continue to teach uh, for two years, both Jews and Greeks. And I think this is where we see a lot of the Greeks start coming in and, and learning the gospel of Christ. And we're going to see it play out uh, within the book of Ephesians, especially get to Ephesians chapter 2, which I think we will. Um, and so when we're, we're dealing with the church here at Ephesus, we're dealing with kind of a mixed bag, right? Where you got both Jews and also Greeks, so we have a divided congregation in those sense, though they're all Christians. Um, he continually teaches here, all who dwelt in Asia, you see that in verse 10. Um, this is where a couple, a little bit of speculation comes in. If you get deep into the prison epistles, the other prison, another prison epistle along with Ephesians is the book of Colossians. And something that he says in Colossians is essentially that he hadn't seen many of them face to face. So speculation says that Paul probably didn't establish the congregation there at Colossae. 
And people believe, as you look here in Acts 19, verse 10, that this is one of the possibilities of, of people from Colossae coming to Ephesus and, and hearing the gospel, and then they return back to Colossae, and then they form a church there. Um, so one of the possibilities there for the book of Colossians, we also see here in Acts chapter 19, verse 10. And this is the third and, and final building block here of the church at Ephesus. Going on from here, verses 11 through 20, we see some of the miracles that are being done. Um, and then verse 21 through uh, pretty much the end of the chapter there, 21 through about 41, that's where we see that riot spark up. Like I talked about earlier, remember the, the entire economy was shifting away from pagan worship and changing. And that's where we see uh, the, the silversmiths get you know pretty worked up about it. Um, yeah, so that, that concludes, we got a few minutes here, we'll start digging into Ephesians here. So that concludes the background that we see here in the book of Acts for the book of, or in the book of Acts for the book of Ephesians. Um, and like I said, it's, it's something that we can go through entirely in one study, something that we can think through, and we had a lot of good discussions. <coughs> I think it, it gives you something that you can walk away with. So if, if someone comes to you and asks you, you know, uh, when you're dealing with the formation of the church at Ephesus, where is that? And you say, well, we see a little bit of it in Acts chapter 18, but mostly you see it in Acts chapter 19. You get you know three building blocks of it. Um, it's something that you can kind of walk away with, with some knowledge. Um, now going on from here, let's let's go to Ephesians chapter. Let's go to Ephesians chapter two. Pick up where I left off. We got about four minutes. Let's see what we can do. Uh, here as we, we start digging into the book of Ephesians, something to understand is that it is all about Christ's church. It is an epistle uh, pretty much completely regarding Christ's church. Um, in the beginning, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, it's the church being the body of Christ. Um, Ephesians chapter 2, with what we'll deal with, it's the church being the reconciled in Christ. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, the church being the glory to God. Ephesians chapter 4, the church being the united in Christ. That's where you get, remember, the seven ones of Ephesians. Uh, there in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 5, I'm sure you know this one, the church being the bride of Christ. You hear it all the time um, at marriage ceremonies. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, the church is the army of the Lord. But here as we, we deal with Ephesians, it's all about um, Christ's church. Now getting into Ephesians chapter we're going to be dealing with the church being the reconciled in Christ. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 1. Uh, chapter 2 is, is rather interesting as we look at it. And we're going to see two before and afters as we, we don't really dig into this, but you're going to see two before and afters within here. It's going to be before you have Christ, those people who are uh, without Christ. And then he, he transitions over in verse 4 to talk about, you know, once you have Christ, this is what it looks like. And he reiterates this once again, beginning in verse 11, uh, now with taking a more Gentile approach and saying, uh, this is who you were before Christ. And yet again, in verse 13, he makes that transition over and saying, well, now who you are with Christ. And then he finishes out um, with talking about uh, Christ being the chief cornerstone. minutes away, and I don't have time to get into it at all. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, probably more about Acts chapter 18 and 19 rather than Ephesians chapter 2. I mean, if you have a question on Ephesians chapter 2, go for it. We just didn't really get into it at all. The, um, uh, the phenomenon or the tradition of following <coughs> certain preachers Mm -hmm. is a very Jewish thing and I saw that uh, like in Jerusalem now in Orthodox Judaism now okay, yeah. um, you pick the preacher you pick the rabbi, rabbi you're yeah. going to follow yeah. and you can recognize them on the street by the hats they wear 
Oh, no way. Yeah, wow. so yeah, even in kids. hot Middle East Jerusalem, no, they're wearing true. fur tall hats or mm -hmm. whatever because that's the particular rabbi they follow. They are known by their, it's their gang sign, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they yeah. still, they still, still do that. Of course, they were doing that in the New, New Testament, too. They were following, you know, different rabbis and, right. you know, speakers. And so it wasn't unusual for <coughs> somebody to gather disciples and travel around right. with them. Um, but that, that's still going on today. And, of course, it's going on in our own. We have to be careful of that. Yeah. When we find a and I'm guilty of this, find a particular preacher that we really like and, and just yeah. think everything that they say is going right. to be correct. So. And that was something that was interesting um, coming from, like, Washington, like I told you, from Washington, where the church is not very strong and where there are really preachers versus coming down here. Washington, we wouldn't have to deal with that at all. You'd be lucky to have a preacher. <laughs> but then coming down here, you Yeah, that's interesting. Even if you tie it in with, with Acts chapter 22, um, they're all talking about setting up the feet of Gamaliel um, or John the Baptist, right? Obviously having disciples. Yeah, that's a good point. I like that. Anything else? Sweet. Well, thank you guys for having me out. Um, thank you guys for, it feels so nice to get out of DFW and just get out. <laughs> I'm from a small town, so I'm, I just feel like the city is closing in. I love getting out here.